boss. I've updated the mission list. We've received a new job offer. The details are on your iDroid. We've finished decoding the informant's report. That floating kid we've run into a few times now. Looks like he was a test subject in clinical experiments. The Soviets called him the third boy. The third boy was brought to a lab on the outskirts of Moscow from Czechoslovakia, after which he was due to be sent to a research center in Leningrad, then Siberia, and finally an academic town in Novosibirsk. It doesn't appear that the researchers witnessed the talents we've seen from him, but nevertheless, he was quite the popular subject. His latent cognitive abilities suddenly awoke en route to Moscow. According to the report, the third boy was easily influenced by other individuals' biofields. Evil thoughts, in particular. They affected his mind like a virus. Extreme anger or resentment, motives for revenge, in other words. Now, during the transport flight to Moscow, the boy was exposed to a powerful mental energy field coming from a certain individual. Ever since, being conscious of his powers, he's become a sort of energy generator. What's unique about him is the way his acute telepathic abilities get taken over by another person's will. The boy began to physically parasitize individuals experiencing extreme anger and codify the host's desires. This includes amplifying the host's natural strengths. Or, in accordance with the host's desires, he can also implant program code in another individual, making them a puppet, essentially. Human neural synapses transmit weak electrical currents between neurons. These electrical currents, though at a level difficult to observe, warp the magnetic field outside the body. The third boy is able to pick up these weak fluctuations. Contrary to psychotronics, which involves controlling the human mind, his abilities as a receptor are too high. The emotions he picks up from another individual are amplified and unleashed into his body as they recur in his brain. They turn into microwaves, which then affect the physical world, triggering paranormal phenomena like the spontaneous combustion of organic matter or psychokinesis, you know, moving an object without touching it. There's one other thing. While he's parasitizing a host, the boy's ego gets shut away, allowing the will of the host to take control of his powers, like some annoying static drowning out your own voice. That means he isn't responsible for what's been happening. Somebody's extreme anger has manifested through the third boy's powers in ways none of us could have predicted. Which would mean this was going on somewhere around us. Looking back on it, a lot of things make sense now. The man on fire, the Sahelanthropus, they both came to life thanks to the third boy's powers. Everything has been happening through him as a catalyst. We first saw him in the hospital on Cyprus. The boy parasitizing the man on fire's desire for revenge gave him his new abilities in return. He next appeared at the Hamid Fighters Fort where the honeybee was hidden. There, the boy parasitized Skullface's vengeful mind. He controlled Sahelanthropus, making it do whatever Skullface wanted. Same goes for when we extracted Emmerich onto the chopper. When he appeared at the Devil's House in Central Africa, Skullface's will controlled the man on fire via the third boy's powers. Everything is clear up to this point. But even the informant couldn't pinpoint who the host was in the cave within Serac power plant. Sahelanthropus suddenly became active, then crushed not only the man on fire, but Skullface as well. Surely neither of them could have been the host. Who else was at that location and bore anger more extreme than either of them? Whose will was controlling Sahelanthropus? According to the report, emotions transmitted in children's brains affect the surrounding magnetic field more strongly. Cerebral nerves are covered with insulation called myelin sheaths to increase impulse speed. The reason for this leakage has to do with the fact that children's myelin sheaths are still developing. So, how many children do you remember being there? Children with a burning desire for revenge and bearing a grudge against you. I can think of only one. 
Eli. We don't know what kind of life he's had, but the resentment he's shown toward adults is nothing short of extraordinary. The third boy resonated with Eli's mind. And that means Eli bore the strongest animosity of all individuals within the boys' reception range, estimated to be a three-mile radius, beating out even Volgan and Skullface. The third boys probably remain hooked on Eli's anger since. You remember at the Devil's House, the third boy showed an interest in Shabani? That must have been his ego making a rare appearance. He may possess abilities far beyond anyone else in the world, but he's still a kid. Maybe them both being kids was enough to bring them together. And if so, maybe with Eli, he isn't feeding off him, but acting in symbiosis with him. So what kickstarted the third boy's powers? If we look at the location and time that his plane went down, we can make a pretty good guess. When the plane experienced the first anomaly, it gave an accurate report of its position to a control tower. Due north of the Black Sea, 125 miles east of Kiev. Dead south on the Black Sea is Cyprus's Green Line. So the plane's position was directly north of the hospital where you'd been asleep for nine years. And this anomaly was reported at exactly the same time that you woke up. The plane was enveloped in flame from the inside out. The fuselage burnt to ashes. There were no survivors, at least not publicly admitted. Your thoughts formed a synchronicity with the boy's psyche and were amplified inside his brain. That would have been more than enough to trigger his abilities. Your rage was like a big bang in his head, blowing the lid off his powers. The boy was then secretly moved to the lab outside of Moscow where Volgan was comatose. There, Volgan's thoughts resonated with the boy and he was awakened. Volgan became the man on fire hell-bent on getting revenge on you. His instincts led him straight to you. Skullface knew Volgan from Operation Snake Eater, or perhaps from even before. Monitoring this pair of extraordinaries, he discovered the hospital and sent his assassin and XOF. Skullface was probably watching the situation from close by. Then, realizing how useful these two test subjects could be, he approached them. Reacting to Skullface's thirst for revenge, this time the boy let Skullface's will control Volgan. Volgan, at times driven by personal revenge, at times through Skullface's will, kept on moving, though his body was little more than dead meat. Perhaps there were moments where even your thoughts affected him as well. But without the boy's power, it was like the plug had been pulled from the socket. Everything was powered by anger, malice, revenge. This is how the end of the report sums things up. Both the third boy and the man on fire were originally test subjects of paranormal research for military applications, like telekinetically controlling the leader of an enemy nation and making him launch a nuke, or stopping the heart of someone on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall, experimenting with latent human abilities. They were used as tools of the Cold War. The boy's only crime was being born with unique gifts. But he was sacrificed on the altar of war. His life reduced to slavery under other people's wills. Turned into a living weapon with no will of his own. And eventually the only emotion he could feel must have been the desire to get revenge for the hand he'd been dealt. Boss, it's you that awakened the boy's powers. But there's more to it than that. I guess the anger emanating from you was something he could truly relate to. Feeling hungry, old timer? <sighs> old timer. I do not get hungry, no. But you have a new hamburger? Uh, you guessed it. And this time we use lamb. Lamb. Uh, you, you're not a lamb kind of guy? A hamburger is made of beef. Whoever heard of a hamburger without beef? Yeah, but we gotta stay fresh, stand out from our competition. You're what? Just give it a try. Um, if you say so.
cannot call this a hamburger. Uh, I thought we were onto something this time. Maybe the problem is that it looks like a regular hamburger. Gotta think outside the box. Too much baggage if they come in expecting just another burger. Let's see, cotton candy? To make it look like a sheep? <laughs> yeah. Just a minute. You really think people would eat that? What is it you are planning? Are you using me? A taste tester? A one-man focus group? Well, actually, I already started. I got a place called uh, Miller's Maxi Buns. You are kidding me. Well, to be honest, business hasn't been great. No one seems to like my, uh, buns. The ocelot said Diamond Dog's budget did not add up. But... You don't mean to tell me. What? No, no, no. Our, our black budget's got it all covered. I'm not embezzling GMP or anything. Still, uh, let's not say anything to Snake, okay? Very well. However, Kazuhira... It takes more than premium ingredients and a clever recipe to satisfy the palate. Okay, so what do we do? The palate seeks one thing. Chemical additives. Chemical additives? There is nothing mysterious or spiritual about good flavor. The tongue simply identifies specific amino acid, which the brain then recognizes as appealing. Therefore, all that is needed is to chemically isolate those amino acids and incorporate them into your products. To be clear, I speak of flavor. The rest is irrelevant. That seems a little extreme. Do not forget that I am a scientist after all. And using science for the benefit of others is a joy. In seeking coexistence with nature's blessings, not everything can remain in its natural form. When we fall ill, we must be treated. Otherwise, that very nature could cost us our lives. Agriculture is one of nature's many blessings. But through that process, we damage the surrounding vegetation. Yeah. Whether it's a massive farm or a tiny field, we always leave our mark on the land. The same is true of parasites. And for food preparation. If tapeworms in the raw meat of another animal enter the human body, they roam around trying to find their usual habitat. Sometimes even eating away at the brain in their confusion. So in looking through a scientific point of view, you see the necessity for processing food. Yes, it is also sometimes necessary to eliminate certain parasites or selectively use or even modify others. Alternatively, we could say that if a man is part of nature, the work he does is also part of it. What is important is the balance. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, old timer. You really opened my eyes. <sighs> I fooled myself into thinking people today wanted high quality, all natural goods, but my favorite burgers were never about that. What they want is something like the first burger I had in America when I went to meet my dad. A Frankenburger loaded with additives. That's the America I knew and loved. I'll be back in a jiffy, old timer. My next burger's gonna knock your socks off. Kazuhira, wait. What is important is how we balance the... Uh, quick for a one-legged man. Frankenburger. What kind of a dive did your old man take you to? <laughs> <laughs>